Hello everyone, how's it going? In the last few videos, we've been talking about nucleophilic substitution and beta elimination through talking about the different reaction pathways, such as SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. But throughout this video, we're going to focus on determining the different variables that would favor one reaction over the others. We're going to do so by focusing on the reaction conditions, the reactant, the nucleophile, or maybe even sometimes the solvent. Moving forward with this video, we have to establish that elimination and nucleophilic substitution products are not exclusive. These two pathways are constantly competing, and we alter the different conditions of the reaction to make sure we favor a certain pathway over the other. In order to dive deep into the different conditions that are favored by substitution, and elimination, we need to talk about each of the conditions separately and then we can refer to them all together to determine the major product. So we're going to start off by talking about nucleophiles and nucleophilic strength. Reaction pathways such as SN2 are really dependent on strong nucleophiles since the reaction happens in one step. So we have to be able to gauge what is a good and strong nucleophile. A nucleophile has two characteristics. It's electron rich a high density of electrons and it's also willing to donate those electrons through a reaction. Put this into perspective, so we have the halides. We know that they're all A ions and they're all electron rich. But iodine, or at least the iodine A ion, is the strongest nucleophilic halide ion. But why? It's because of its size. It's electron rich but it's also willing to give up its electrons. Because of its size, it isn't attached too closely to those outer valence electrons, as what we will see in fluorine, for example. That balance between high electron density and willingness to give up those electrons, that defines a nucleophile. For example, we can tell why hydroxide is a stronger nucleophile than water since it's more electron dense. But it gets a little harder as we blur those lines. For example, why is ethoxide a stronger nucleophile than that carboxylate ion? It's because that carboxylate ion has resonance, decreasing the strength of that negative charge, whereas the uh, ethoxide does not. So it's very centralized and localized negative charge that can act as a nucleophile. You can have one of the strongest nucleophiles, but if we don't have a really good leaving group, the reaction might not occur. A good leaving group is something that once it leaves the molecule, it can handle its negative charge or it's neutral. For example, a hydroxide is not a good leaving group because it's very reactive. A kind of rule of thumb is a leaving group is bad if it becomes more reactive through leaving the molecule. And a hydroxide is way more reactive than an alcohol. So how do we make an OH group leave? We protonate it. We turn the leaving group from hydroxide to water because water is neutral and it will be okay with leaving. It's okay with leaving because we're coupling the removal of water with the removal of that positive charge from having oxygen bond into three things. We were discussing nucleophiles. We wanted strong localized negative charges. But with some leaving groups being A ions, we want them to be able to handle their charge. This is why larger molecules such as iodine will be a better leaving group than fluorine. Why molecules that can have resident structures and dismissing their negative charge will be a stronger leaving group. While talking about the different variables we just mentioned, the nucleophile, the leaving group, we know we have intermediates and transition states. So. The different types of solvents we use throughout these reactions can be beneficial or hurt the reaction pathway. For example, we know that when we do SN2 and E2 reactions, we have strong bases and strong nucleophiles. We wouldn't want to use a polar protic solvent because our nucleophile or our base would just react with the acidic hydrogen of the solvent. But using an aprotic solvent, a solvent that is polar but does not have acidic hydrogens would work best because we wouldn't have to worry about our nucleophile reacting 
with the solvent. This is why to have effective SN2 reactions, you might see DMSO or different ethers such as diethyl ether be used as the reaction solvent. Here on the other hand, using polar protic solvents is really favorable for SN1 and E1 pathways because the polar protic solvents have very strong intermolecular forces with the carbocation, helping us reduce the strength of that positive charge, making a more stable intermediate. Let's start talking about some of the features that would favor elimination over substitution, or likewise, substitution over elimination. We can have a very strong nucleophile, but steric hindrance can prevent it from attacking the electrophile. Bulky electrophiles are a huge hindrance to nucleophilic substitution and insanely favor elimination. The steric hindrance of a reaction isn't exclusive to the electrophile, but a relationship to the length of the nucleophile and the electrophile. We can have branched or bulky nucleophiles too. For example, methoxide would be a lot smaller and easier to attack the electrophile than something like propoxide, because propoxide has three carbons and methoxide has one. Next one can be kind of tricky, but it's going to help us determine whether we're going to do elimination or substitution in some scenarios. This is the difference between a base and a nucleophile. All nucleophiles are bases, but not all bases are nucleophiles. Remember, a nucleophile is something with an increase of electron density that is willing to use that electron density throughout a chemical reaction, whereas a base is going to react with a proton. It can sound similar, but there are clear differences. We talked about some of the features that benefit a really good nucleophile. And when it comes to measuring the strength of a base, this is when we talk about acids and bases again. For example, iodine is the conjugate base of a strong acid, hydroiodic acid. So that means that it's a weak conjugate base. So as a base, iodine is not going to function well but it's a really good nucleophile. So we might see it in nucleophilic substitution, but not elimination. Another good example is to look at oxides. As we grow the alkyl chains of the oxides, we're increasing their basicity, but decreasing their nucleophilic strength. This is because of the inductive effect. An oxide with a growing alkyl chain grows that negative charge's strength because of the inductive effect pooling electron density off of the R groups. So if we had a hydroxide, we might lean more closer to nucleophilic substitution than elimination. But if we had a bulky oxide, such as 2-propoxide, we might lean more towards elimination than substitution. Now we're going to start looking at different reactions and determining whether or not we're going to favor nucleophilic substitution or beta elimination for the favored product. There are some reaction conditions that there are a dead giveaway. For example, methyl halides is strictly SN2 because elimination results in the formation of a double bond, so we need at least two carbons. And SN1 and E1 pathways do not favor methyl carbocations because of the instability. Now let's look at these two examples. In the first example, we have bromoethane and the two possible products, ethene and 1-methoxyethane. So we have a nucleophilic substitution product and an elimination product. We see that this is a primary alkyl halide, so we might be favoring SN2 and E2. We have a methoxide. So that might lean closer to the nucleophilic substitution route, but elimination is still possible. We know that it's a very strong nucleophile and electrophile. It's not really sterically hindered or bulky. We have DMSO, which is an aprotic solvent. So another favor towards nucleophilic substitution, SN2. On top of that, we have cold conditions. Cold conditions favor nucleophilic substitution and heated conditions favor elimination. 
So even though we have the possibility of elimination, nucleophilic substitution through the SN2 pathway is definitely going to be the major product throughout this first reaction. Now let's look on to the second reaction. We have two iodopropane forming one propene. It's the major product. We don't have any minor products. Let's wonder why. So this reaction is E1 favored. So let's do some investigation to figure out why. First of all, we have a polar product solvent, which is this methanol, which is going to be favorable for the carbocation intermediate. We have our base as SO42 minus, which is a good base, but not so good as a nucleophile since it has residence. On top of that, we have a secondary alkyl halide, which is great for SN1 and E1, but since this condition is heated with a strong base, but not a strong nucleophile, it definitely leans over to the E1 pathway. Hence why we have a major product of around 99%. Well, I hope this video and these infographics helped in your studies of nucleophilic substitution and elimination. Remember, all these infographics are for free download on my website, and I hope you guys have a great day. I also wanted to quickly mention that I'm selling a little collection of all my educational infographics about organic chemistry for the first semester.